thank you all so much for, for coming to this event tonight. I think this is extremely important. Um, so I appreciate you um, coming here. Um, so today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, there is also Yom HaShoah, which is um, another day for, for remembrance that is more widely um, shown, I think, in, in some Jewish communities, but, but today is, is uh, the most widely accepted date for Holocaust remembrance. Um, and so, you know, I, I have seen a lot that in uh, non-religious schools that the education that is provided for um, the history of the Holocaust um, is, is not very in-depth. So I, I wanted to try and create this opportunity for us to have the, uh, the privilege of hearing a survivor speak to us. So um, with that, tonight we have uh, Mr. Steen Metz. Um, and uh, Ms. McGuire, if you could begin sharing the, the presentation. And, and Mr. Metz, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. And first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. As you mentioned earlier, it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And that refers to a date that was established by United Nations in the year 2005. And it signifies the date 76 years ago when Auschwitz, the biggest concentration camps of them all and the most infamous one, were liberated by the Soviets on January 27th, 1945. It was one of the first camps that were liberated. And I always wonder how many thousand of Jewish people lost their lives after the, the camp was liberated and until uh, the Holocaust was over in May of 1945. I'm very lucky to be able to talk to you this evening. In the camp I was in, there was 15,000 children, 14 years and younger. There were less than 10% or around 1,200 people who survived. So I'm going to share with you some of my experiences uh, prior to my stay in camp, transportation to the camp during my time in camp and returning to Denmark uh, after liberation. And at the end of my talk, you will have plenty of time for questions and you may want to start thinking about some of the questions. But I also want to emphasize the importance of sharing the Holocaust story with as many people as possible. It's 76 years ago, younger people especially are forgetting that we had a Holocaust. Some of them cannot even remember a name of a Holocaust camp. There's increased amount of anti-Semitism. A recent survey showed uh, how uh, important it is to use education as a tool to remind everybody about the Holocaust because so many people have started forgetting about it. If I may have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. I want to ask each of you to be my ambassador. I'm gonna ask each of you, it's probably the easiest homework you will have all week, to share the story with at least four people and don't necessarily start with four. Talk to them about the Holocaust. Tell them you know that the Holocaust took place because you had the opportunity to listen to an eyewitness. I wrote a book about 10 years ago, it was updated two years ago, called A Danish Boy <clears throat> in Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt is the German version of the camp I was in. Terzen would be the Czech version. The camp was located for was then Czechoslovakia. And I'll use both the German version and the Czech version as I talk to you tonight. Reflections of a Holocaust survivor. Uh, the next slide, please. 
Thank you. This slide shows <clears throat> a map of Denmark. It probably looks a lot bigger than it is. It's around the size of Rhode Island. And I want to go back to April the 9th, 1940. 81 years ago, and it was a fatal day in Denmark's history. That was the day that the evil man, Hitler, invaded Denmark by land, by sea, and by air. And you can see that Denmark is surrounded by water. It was totally unexpected. Denmark had signed a non-aggression pact with Germany, with Hitler. It didn't mean anything. As a matter of fact, there were 20 other countries in Europe that had also signed an agreement with Hitler. And again, it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. I was five years old at the time. And I can still remember the planes flying in over Denmark. And there were ships harboring different harbors and the German soldiers were marching in. You can see from the map that Denmark borders to the Germany in the south. It was a very short battle. It lasted less than 24 hours. Denmark surrendered. There was no way that they were prepared to fight the big war machine from Germany. I'm not going to say whether that was good or bad. I'll let history judge it, but I do know that it saved thousands of uh, people. It's when I look back and think about it, and I appreciate it and understand it better today than during the war years when I was very, very young, I was a young boy. It's amazing that the first three and a half years conditions were relatively, and I want to emphasize the word, relatively normal. They were certainly normal compared to other occupied countries in Denmark. I was able to be able to go to school. I went to a public school. I did not go to a Jewish school. I lived in the middle of the country, and you can see the town Odense, you may call it Odense, framed with a red frame around it. And there were very, very few Jewish people in that town. Most of the Jewish people, probably about 95%, lived around Copenhagen, which you can see on the East Coast. And uh, they lived not only in Copenhagen, but in the surrounding areas. At that time, there were only about 8,000 Jewish people. And that was probably one of the reasons why conditions were relatively normal. Another reason, and probably more important, was the fact that Denmark produced many great food products, pork, eggs, butter, cheese, and so on. And we used to export them to Great Britain, but that was changed right away. Now we ship food down to Germany, and we also fed all the troops in Denmark. So those were some of the reasons why conditions were relatively normal. On the next slide, please. <clears throat> On my favorite one, it really tells the story. King Christian X, he was around 70 years old in 1940. Despite the war, despite the Holocaust, despite the occupancy by the Germans in Denmark, he continued to ride his horse every day. You can see he's all by himself, <clears throat> no bodyguards. And he did that to support the Danish people. And he was also a big supporter of the Jewish people. What I like about this picture especially is two Nazi soldiers saluting the king. The king doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And he looks straight forward. Not only was the king able to continue to rule, but the Danish government was able to continue to govern. Yes, they got some direction from the Nazis, from the Nazi commandant in Denmark. But uh, we still had the cabinet. Uh, they had to make some 
concessions. They were not able to employ any Jewish people. But uh, I remember very clearly bicycling to and from school. I lived on the outskirts of my town, Odense, and I would bicycle. The uh, my school was located in the middle of town. And I can remember seeing the German soldiers very intimidating in their ugly green uniform and with their weapons. And I would try to avoid them. I was never touched, they never harmed me, but uh, I was afraid of them. There was no question about it. On the next slide, I'm sure you can uh, recognize that picture. This is of a young Steen Metz. I'm sure I haven't changed that much. This goes back to the summer of 1943. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is the fact that my family, <clears throat> my father, my mother, and myself, we went on vacation. And I didn't think about it when I was eight years old. Uh, it was very natural. We would go on vacation every year. But when I think back, during the occupancy of the Nazis, we were able to go on vacation and having a good time. It's very, very surprising. Unfortunately, things changed dramatically in the fall of 1943. What happened between April the 9th and the fall of 1943? Young people, some of them your age, upperclassmen in high school, students in colleges and universities, they were very unhappy <clears throat> that the Danish government <clears throat> had surrendered so easily and they wanted to fight with the Nazis. Had nothing to do with the Danish government. It was all arranged by young people they formed groups. One of the more famous groups was the Churchill Group in my hometown, Odense. And literally in every town you see on the map, they had a group of young people that would make life as miserable as they could of the Nazis. <clears throat> they would bomb rail tracks. They would bomb factories that made products for the Germans. They would sink the Danish fleet so the Germans couldn't use it. And it's just amazing what these young people achieved. They got help from Sweden. Sweden was our neighbor. You can see Sweden to the east of Denmark. And they provided some weapons. Weapons and bombs were parachuted down by British troops flying in over Denmark and they were picked up by the young people during the darkness. The young people were so successful that the German commandant went to the Danish prime minister, told him this had to stop immediately. They had to arrest the saboteurs and they had to sentence them to death. There was no way the Danish government would agree to do that. Consequently, they resigned and the Danish administration took over. And that became the beginning of the roundup of the Jewish people. But once again, something very uniquely happened in Denmark. A leading Danish, a leading German Nazi who had ties with Denmark found out about the arrest date. And we're now talking about late September, early October, 1943. He leaked the word to the Danish synagogue in Copenhagen. Word spread very fast. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the Jewish people lived in that area. And over the next two or three weeks, 
many families in Denmark stood up for what they thought were right. They had a great deal of courage and they housed the Jewish people. They were hiding them in their homes. They were hiding in churches. They were hiding in hospitals under false names. And as a result, and this did not happen in any other country in Europe, 95% or 7,500 people, Jewish people, managed to escape to Sweden. It was a very unique operation. You can see the water between Denmark and Sweden at this narrowest place. It's only about a mile and a half or two miles. As a matter of fact, the cousin of mine in Copenhagen and his mother, they were hiding in the loft of a church. And there's been a lot written about the heroes in Denmark and they deserve it. There's probably been less written about the 5% of the people that ended up in a concentration camp. You have to remember the communications were so different in those days. Can you imagine a world without TV? We certainly didn't have smartphones. We relied on newspapers and radio and phones. The phone lines were cut off by the Nazis. To my knowledge, my family <clears throat> living in the middle of the country <clears throat> had not been warned. And as a result, on October 2nd, 1943, two Gestapo officers pounded on our door. It came as a sub complete surprise to my family. After conditions had been normal the first three and a half years, they didn't expect that anything would happen. I remember after the war, my mother was asked by friends, why didn't you escape or try to escape? And she answered, we didn't think it was going to be serious. We got about an hour to get ready. And during that time, my mother and I were allowed on the ground floor where there was a bakery and they opened early and the baker helped us giving us some rolls, bread and some Danish pastry and we were able to take that with us and were able to share it with the other Jewish people uh, later on. So we were transported from our home in the truck that you see, you see several trucks on the left. And we were in a schoolyard in the middle of Odense. And there's supposed to be 60 Jewish people assembled in the schoolyard. I wish I could recognize my family in the picture I've tried several times for magnifying glass, but I haven't been able to. But it's quite an artifact. And to my knowledge, it's the only picture taken of the arrest of the Jewish people. We spent a couple of hours in the schoolyard. And later on, we were transferred into cattle cars, very similar to the model you see here. Some of you might have been to the museum, the Holocaust Museum in Skokie. It's not too far away from Evanston and seen a similar cattle car. We were transported and spent over 80 hours in the cattle car. It was very, very tight. There were four children about my age. I was 80, eight years old at the time. The four of us were able to lie down. The rest of the people alternate between sitting and standing. There wasn't even enough place, space for everybody to sit down. Can you imagine doing that in complete darkness over three days and three nights? We were not fit. 
We shared whatever food we had brought from home, our bakery products, other people had snacks, some people had sandwiches. Most of the people came from outside of Odense. As I mentioned earlier, we, uh, there were very few Jewish people in my hometown. It was completely dark. There were no lights, there were no windows, there were no doors. There was a door, but it was locked from the outside. People looked very, very worried. I had no idea what was going on. My parents tried to explain it to me the, as well as they could, but I couldn't understand. Why was I there? Why was my cousin there, not there, or some of our, our neighbors? We got a break, got some fresh air, got back into the cattle car, we got some water to drink, and the atmosphere throughout the trip, very, very intense. The smell getting worse and worse. There were no bathroom facilities. We had to use buckets in the corner. As a matter of fact, in another cattle car, there was a person, elderly person who took her own life she didn't want to end up in a concentration camp. <clears throat> Eventually, we ended up in Tersen, about 550 miles from Denmark. Tersen was located about 40 miles north of Prague in Czechoslovakia. Today, it is the Czech Republic. On the next slide, you'll see the train station on the left, and then you'll see people, Jewish people with their stars, Jew, Jewish stars, Star David, on their outerwear, walking about a mile and a half to the barracks, to the concentration camp. At that time, there was no train station in Terrasen. As soon as we arrived in Terrasen, we were ordered to empty our pockets they took all our valuables, they took our money, jewelry, they opened our suitcases, took whatever was valuable, even some of our good clothes. Can you imagine when we were arrested, and I think it was the same for everybody, the Nazis encouraged us to bring money because we were able to spend it we actually supported inadvertently the German army. Next, we were separated <clears throat> children, 14 years and younger, women, men, seniors, 65 years and older. And on the next picture, you'll see a loft. And this was very typical of our dwelling for the next 18 months. In my book, I refer to it as 18 months in hell. It's hard to imagine that we were able to survive those 18 months. I'm also surprised that I was able to stay with my mother in the women's barrack. <clears throat> I was eight years old and somehow my mother was able to convince the authorities that I should stay with her. I still wonder how she was able to persuade the powers to be, that be. I think it was good for my mother. I think it was good for myself and we were able to support each other. My father would be staying in a barrack with a loft similar to this one. It was very hot in the summer. You can see the bunk beds uh, where we were sleeping on the bunk beds or trying to sleep. It was very difficult in the beginning. There were ants, there were fleas, there were lice. I would be scratching myself and I didn't understand. My mother was able to try to explain 
what was going on. Everybody 15 years or over had to work slave labor, long hours, 10 to 12 hours a day, weekends, no Jewish holidays, no Christian holidays. And like everybody else, my father had to work. He was very, very unlucky. He was exposed to some heavy construction work in the street. He wasn't used to that kind of work. He was an attorney used to litigating in the courthouse and working in an office. And suddenly in the beginning of winter, he had to dig holes and do other road work. He couldn't handle it, got very little food. And I'll tell you about it a little later on. He ended up in infirmary and in the infirmary, there were some very capable nurses and doctors basically Jewish people from many different countries, Czechoslovakia, Holland, Austria, Denmark, and so on. Later on, I found out from a young man who worked in my father's work group that he was physically abused. <clears throat> he was whipped, he was kicked when he didn't work hard enough to satisfy the Nazis. One day when he was wearing an overcoat to keep warm, an officer came over and literally tore the coat off him. You don't work with an overcoat on. That's easy to say because they didn't provide uniforms. As I mentioned, he was in infirmary probably spending two to three months there. He lost my mother told me about half of his body weight and eventually he passed away after less than six months in camp, 40 years old, married to my mother for less than 10 years. And there was no way the Germans would list his, on his death certificate that he died of hunger or starvation. They listed it as pneumonia. They didn't want the world to know that we many people starved to death. To my knowledge, my mother was not physically abused, but she was certainly mentally abused a number of times. <clears throat> One day, she had many different jobs. She worked in a factory. She cleaned the floor. At the end of the day, a German officer came in to inspect the floor. It looked shiny, clear, clean. That's what my mother told me, and I believe her. And suddenly the German officer found a bucket with dirty water and he literally kicked it over and the dirty water spread all over the floor. So now my mother, and she was very tired, as I mentioned earlier, they worked long hours. She had to clean the floor again. And when she got back to the barracks, she was very, very upset. What can you do? It's hard to imagine how one human being can treat another human being in that manner. Being eight years old, <clears throat> I didn't have to work. I uh, worked voluntarily. My mother thought it was a good idea. Not much you can do when you're eight, nine years old. I became a messenger and I would go from one German office to the other. The German soldiers looked very intimidating and I would try and rush from one to the other. But again, they never did any physical harm uh, to me. I did that for a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the, wind, uh, in the afternoon. On my way back, I passed the kitchen and at the end of the building, there were some big sacks of raw potatoes. I looked around and when nobody was watching me and I was very, very careful because I cannot imagine what the consequences would have been if they had found out. And I stole 
couple of potatoes, put one in each pocket, and I shared them with my mother. I did that a number of times, and we needed all the help we could get because we got very little food. At breakfast, we would get substitute coffee, more boiled water than coffee. We would get half a loaf of bread to share within the family for the whole week. At lunch, we would line up and you can see some old people with their canes. And we had uh, a wooden spoon and a bowl and we would line up for soup because that's all we got at lunch. And we got potato soup just about every day. I couldn't eat it the first couple of days. It was terrible. And my mother said, Steen, you have to eat it or you won't make it. That was all the incentive I needed. And we tried, when we got to the kettle, we tried to get the soup from the bottom of the kettle, because at least then we would get some potato peel with it. But it was basically boiled water with potato peel. I never knew who ate the heart of the potato, but I guess that was the guards. At dinner, we would line up again. We would get soup, and that would be a different kind of soup. Barley soup was one I remember. And potato soup was only for lunch. And then once a week, we got a typical German uh, pasta dish, uh, dumplings. How were we able to survive, especially the people that worked like my father and mother on those meager portions? It was very, very difficult. 35,000 people out of a total of 140,000 prisoners who passed through to Riesenstadt in three and a half years died, most of them from hunger and starvation. I want to give you, now before I, I give you another example, I, I, I want to talk about what really saved my mother and myself. We started getting food pass parcels, packages from our friends in Denmark, from our family, Jewish family in Sweden. They started arriving in April. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks too late to save my father. And we got the packages on a regular basis. All prisoners, whether you were from Holland, Czechoslovakia, or Germany, got packages from home. But there was no question the Danes got more packages than anybody else. We got food, we got vitamins, and we got clothing. And the reason we got more than anybody else, we had a tremendous support system. And while we did have anti-Semitism in Denmark at that time, it was very limited and much less than in other countries, as an example, in Poland. So one day, we received a parcel, a package. My mother couldn't understand it was so heavy. She opened it. And the reason it was so heavy, when she opened the package, all she found were stones. Those cruel, cruel guards had taken all the good stuff and even had the nerve to replace the food and so on with stones. My mother was very upset, but again, there's nothing you can do. And again, how can anybody get satisfaction out of treating another human being that way. Maybe they didn't think that we were human beings and that came right from the top, right from Hitler. I wanna give you another example of time in camp, what happened. I was a growing boy, my shoes didn't fit me anymore, no department stores, no shoe stores, so my mother bartered, and I think she was probably good at it, with a Czech lady, 
and the Czech lady got some Danish food and my mother and I got some used shoes that I was able to wear the rest of the time. I didn't realize it at that time, but later on I was told that if you had food, it was like gold, you could get just about anything uh, in, in the camp in one way or the other. I'm often asked, what did I do in camp other than standing in line for food three times a day and working a couple of hours in the morning and afternoon. I played with other children and I played soccer. We didn't have a real soccer field. It was a gravel field. We didn't have real goalposts. The soccer ball consisted of old racks or clothing that the mothers tied together and were able to kick it around. When I think back, that was probably the only time that I truly felt like an eight or nine year old boy should feel, forgetting that I was in prison, forgetting about the thick walls that surrounded uh, the camp with the barbed wire on top and watchtowers. Then one day, my friends, and I played a lot with some Czech children, didn't show up. And I went back to my mother and said, I really miss them. She said, don't worry. They probably didn't feel well, didn't feel like playing that particular day, and they would be back. Little did I know until much later what actually happened to these friends of mine. My mother wanted to shield her nine-year-old boy from the real story. My Czech friends, without any questions, since I never saw them again, were deported in cattle cars, as you see on this picture, on this slide. And people are literally being shoveled into the cattle car with a Gestapo officer watching over it. And my mother later on told me that there were terrible scenes at the train station. Men wanted to accompany their wives and vice versa. And they wanted to keep their children and to raise the stuff because they felt they had a better chance to survive. There were about 85,000 Jewish and other camps had non-Jewish people as well. In Serrations, that or Tarsen, it was Jewish people only. 85,000 disappeared in the cattle cars going to Auschwitz, Birkenau, and other, uh, what are referred to as cattle, uh, as uh, killing centers, basically meaning there were gas chambers. And, Many of them died at gas chambers. I am looking at my watch and I want to make sure we have ample time for questions and answers. So I'm going to skip the next two slides and we can always get back to them. I refer to this as happier times. <clears throat> and in April of 1945, after 18 long, long months, White buses came from Sweden. There were Swedish buses. Look at the Swedish flags and the logo, Red Cross logo on all sides. We couldn't believe it when we were told by the Danish chief rabbi who was also in camp that uh, we would be liberated. It's hard to imagine when you go through so many days and it went very, very slowly. And it's very uncertain. Are you gonna be transported to Auschwitz the next day? Are you gonna get enough food to eat? Are you gonna get ill and not make it? Fortunately, we boarded the buses. They were driven by Danish and Swedish drivers. And again, I wanna emphasize that Sweden was a neutral country and we got a warm, warm welcome. There was probably a convoy of about, I think 20, 25 buses. And then there were motorbikes uh, to lead the convoy. And then there were medical cars. And uh, there were 
little less than 500 Jewish people that were sent through the reasons that in, in, in addition to my father, we lost about 50 people. Most of them before we started getting the packages from Denmark. It was a miracle that the buses were able to drive through Germany. It was a miracle they were able to go back through Germany. The war was still going on. They were painted, the buses were painted white, Red Cross colors. Hopefully nobody would bomb the buses. But it's amazing that we all survived. We made several stops. I remember we stopped at a forest for several hours and there was bombardment going on all around us. Eventually we ended up, we uh, came to Denmark on the next slide. You'll see us getting a warm, warm welcome. When you look at that slide, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine that Denmark was still being occupied. There's row upon row of people welcoming us home. They had chocolates for the children, snacks and sandwiches for all of us, and then cigarettes for the adults. And when you think back, it's about 76 years ago. At that time, just about everybody smoked. Nobody knew it wasn't healthy. And today, smokers are in the minority. We were not able to stay in Denmark, but we went over to Sweden and we were in quarantine for about a week. They wanted to make sure that we didn't bring any illnesses into the country. Later on, we reconnected with my family that had uh, most of my family, and they were all from Copenhagen, except my family, uh, were in Sweden. And we reconnected with them. It was wonderful to see them again. And we spent a couple of months in Sweden. And on the next slide, you'll see the Danish flag. And on May the 5th, 1945, it was flying all over Denmark. That was the day the Germans surrendered after five long years of occupation in Denmark. And everybody celebrated and we celebrated in Sweden, but it wasn't the same as being in Denmark. And I really, I mean, I was free in Sweden, no question about it, but didn't really feel free until I got back to Denmark. And May the 5th is also my birthday. And in 1945 was my 10-year birthday. And ever since I have celebrated May the 5th, the surrender of the Germans, flying the Danish flag all over, and I used to tell my friends and anybody who would listen, the reason they were flying the flag was to celebrate my birthday. Some weeks later, we returned to Denmark on a boat from Sweden to Denmark. The white buses saved about 15,000 prisoners from many different camps. When we got back to Denmark, First of all, we were very grateful to General Eisenhower and the Allies for saving, for defeating the Germans. Without that, I cannot imagine what the world would be like. We lived in an apartment and that had been rented out. The personal belongings had been stored by the company where my father worked. So we had nowhere else to stay. We stayed with some friends. They provided us with some clothes, they fed us, we went shopping, and there wasn't this, they couldn't do enough to make us happy. The opposite was the case in many other countries, especially in Poland. There was a widespread anti-Semitism in Poland. It was almost impossible for the Polish Jews that survived the Holocaust to go back to Poland. Later on, 
I returned to my school. There was no official schooling in camp, in any camps. There were some teachers that taught secretly. I got lessons secretly. I got some private lessons from a teacher when I returned to my hometown. Later on, I was able to join my old schoolmates in fifth grade. I'd missed all of fourth grade and part of third grade. But I think the transition period for me went much smoother being able to join my uh, friends from school. I graduated from high school some years later, then from commercial college. Then I wanted to see part of the world since I lived in such a small country. And I joined a Danish food company that made products primarily for export. After special training in Denmark, I went to England, then Canada, United States. I got married to uh, my wife, 58 years, Eileen, in Canada. We went to the United States in 1962. I was transferred by the Danish company. And I've been in the United States ever since. Later on, I joined some American companies like Sarah Lee and Kraft, as an example. I wanted a challenge of working for an American company. And I retired in 1999. And in June of this year, it'll be 22 years since I retired. And time has just flown. And I compare it to the 18 months that we spent in camp. In 2013, or 12, 2012, after I written my book, I started talking to students like yourself. And I feel very strongly, not only because it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day, but it's becoming more and more important to educate the young people today so they know about the Holocaust, so they don't forget about it. And since that time, I've spoken to over 85,000 people, mostly students. And my goal or my short-term goal is to reach 100,000. My mother lived until she was 90, so maybe we have good genes in the family. I can go on and on, but I'll stop here and I'll just show you on the next slide where I have my website. And if anybody is interested, uh, they, they can write to me or you can look at my homepage and get some more back in, background information on me. And now I will be happy to open up to questions and I look forward to answering your questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Metz, for sharing that. Um, that is truly incredible, um, and it is a um, an honor and a, and a privilege to be able to hear that. So thank you. Um, so now we'll move to the uh, the, the questions uh, section of this, um, and I think the easiest way to do this um, through Zoom is if you click, uh, we'll just say if you click yes, like the the check mark. I think everybody should be able to do that, and then from there I'll. Uh, It'll, it'll say that I'm requesting for you to unmute yourself and then you can enable your video and ask your question. Um, so we can, uh, we can begin that now. Hi, thank you so much for um, speaking to us today. I teach seventh and eighth grade humanities and we're actually studying the Holocaust right now. Um, oh, very timely. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is you're, you're, the timing of, of Holocaust Remembrance of State fit with my curriculum. <laughs> But I, you know, we, we've been studying kind of historic anti-Semitism because as we told our students, we're not teaching them about the Holocaust so that they can memorize that 6 million Jews were killed. We're teaching about them, the, them about the Holocaust so they can recognize the things that lead up to things like this and, and kind of create a better world. And, um, and so we started with kind of historic anti-Semitism. Why, why were the Jews the... the why, why did Jews become the, the victims of the Holocaust? That it wasn't that somebody woke up with a new idea. Anti-Semitism 
and you know was in Europe for thousands of years. And um, I know Denmark and you know, Scandinavia as a whole, and 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 Denmark was not nearly as anti-Semitic from like the part of Europe that my family comes from, which is the the Pale of Settlement, Poland, Lithuania, um, you know that that Russia, that part of the world. Um, so one of the things that that we talked about was language, and that um, for for Sephardic Jews who who lived in kind of the former Ottoman Empire part of of the um, of Europe, anti-Semitism also wasn't as prevalent. And um, you know, Italian Jews, even though Mussolini fought with Hitler, you know, there wasn't as much anti-Semitism, but when those people were sent to concentration camps, they died at a higher rate because they couldn't communicate with the guards. So in addition to everything else, they didn't speak Yiddish. And so they didn't understand the German that was being shouted. And so were more likely to be killed for not following directions or understanding. So I was wondering as somebody coming from Denmark, um, were, there, were there any sort of language it, it was, you know, the concentration camps were really dominated by by Ashkenazi Jews from the Pale of Settlement, right? Because um, we know what happened in that part of the world. So were there any kind of communication? Like, I really never, you know, I, I always heard the stories of Denmark, but I never thought about the people who didn't escape. It's like, oh, well, everybody in Denmark escaped. So what, what was that sort of experience to be part of this group, but also from a really different reality than most of the people you were with. Does yeah. that make sense of the question? Yeah, I understand okay. the question. Thank you very much for getting us started. Sorry it was so long I'm on the so, history teacher. <laughs> I'm so happy that I get a chance to talk to your group because a lot of people think that all the Danes were saved and then they escaped to Sweden. But from a language point of view, I couldn't speak any German at that time. German was the official language. My father and mother could speak some and could write, write some, so they understood it. But there were two words I'll never forget, and they were German words. And whatever we had to do, the Germans would shout, snell, snell, quick, quick, or fast, fast, rouse, rouse, out, out, come out, and, and so on. I, was, I learned the Czech language phonetically while I was in camp. And I was able to play with my Czech friends and we were able to talk, that I was able to talk the Czech language. Generally speaking at that age, it's easier for you to communicate with other children. I had never heard before, and I don't question the statement that the people that didn't speak German or Yiddish uh, tended to be killed by, or lose out by not getting enough food or whatever. I, I'd, never, I'd never heard that, but I, I don't question it. Yeah, I think um, what we learned in class that it was, it was mostly Sephardic Jews who, who only spoke Spanish um, that really struggled with this kind of language. Difference. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. I, do I, I know you do, do. I don't know if everybody, I wanted to give enough context for everyone else on this call also. Yeah. Did, uh, did I answer your question? You did. You did. I mean, I think that that's um, an important in in learning about any culture and anything that happened to a group of people, even within a group that that were not monolithic. So, you know, the the Jewish community that that was impacted by the Holocaust wasn't completely monolithic. There were a lot of different, a lot of differences within the Jewish community at that well today and at that time. Thank you again so much. Thank you for getting us started. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, firstly, I just want to say uh, uh, it's it's an honor meeting someone who lived through such a impactful and powerful part of history. Uh, and uh, I guess my question is, as someone who studies history and um, I, I actually want to become a historian when I'm older, but is, uh, so I guess I kind of, I would say I know a little bit about the Holocaust in, in general, a, a good amount. And I know um, just how awful some parts of it were. So I, my question is, I guess, 
uh, as someone who lived through such a dark period, what, what is your advice uh, for, for younger people, um, I guess, uh, just in general, to make sure stuff like that doesn't ever happen again? First of all, I think education is very, very important. We all mm -hmm. like to say, we'd never want it to happen again. Unfortunately, we have not learned from the Holocaust because what's happening in Syria, what happened in the old Yugoslavia, what happened in Rwanda is really a different name. It's called genocide instead of Holocaust, but it's basically yeah. the same. If I was to pass on, any advice would be uh, try and treat other people the way you want to be treated yourself. The opposite of the way that Hitler and his people treated us. Don't lose faith. Make sure that you try and fight, so to speak, fight in quotes to the last minute. My mother was often asked, did you ever give up? And she said, no, you cannot afford to give up when you have an eight or nine year old boy. And she was very, very tenacious. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, we both uh, uh, survived. So those would be uh, uh, some of the things uh, I would mention. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for um, meeting with us here and doing this. And I want to say, I think it's incredibly important that we don't just look at the numbers, don't just, um, you, yeah, recite numbers, how many people died, but also look at the individual people and look at the individual stories because um, um, each person is, I believe, you know, valuable as their own. And that's why we have to look at each person, how, how, um, and at their individual story, which is why I think this is incredibly valuable. Um, so my question to you is uh, looking back, what goes through your mind when you think about the guards that were actually terrorized you and how do you explain that they were able to do what they did? It's hard to imagine today that anybody would follow Hitler, but he had a tremendous following. He was a good speaker, but what I understand is where he got the idea about pursuing the, uh, the, the Jewish people came back. So I don't know if you have learned this in history, but a little over a hundred years ago, there was a genocide in Turkey and Armenian, about a million and a half Armenians were killed by the Turks. And many people think that that was a model for Hitler going after the Jewish uh, people. It's hard to imagine that he was able to survive. There were several attempts on his life. Unfortunately, nobody managed uh, uh, to kill him. And uh, the people, it was right from, from this young, the young Jews, there were a lot of young, uh, not Jews, but a young uh, people that were joined the, the Nazis at a very young age and they were just, they had no choice. It doesn't mean that all the people that followed Hitler uh, believed in him, but many of them didn't have the choice. Um, unfortunately, there were, in my mind, too many people uh, that, that followed him. And at one time, it sure looked like he would win. And as I mentioned, if the allies and the uh, Americans hadn't come into the war, uh, it's just frightening to think uh, what, what could have happened. But your point is well taken, it goes well beyond uh, uh, numbers. Uh, th there's, no, uh, th there's no question about it, but I don't want to use too many numbers, but it's really frightening when you think about it. There were 9 million Jewish people when the Holocaust started and 6 million of the 9 million uh, literally were murdered just because they happen to be Jews. Appreciate your question. I hope I answered it. Yes, thanks.
why do you think that there was less anti-Semitism in Denmark as opposed to the other countries? And is there anything about the Danish experience or attitude that any way you think that could be uh, transferred or exported to other countries to have more acceptance? I think there are a number of reasons for it. In Denmark, it's due to the culture in Denmark. It's due to the fact that they're integrated. It doesn't mean that in this area are all the Jewish people, in this area are all the Catholic people. They were totally integrated. And people in Denmark, whatever nationality they, they were earlier, if they were not from Denmark, or whatever faith they had, first of all, considered a Dane. I remember my mother was asked after the war, uh, did she consider herself a, a Jew? Or, or Dane, she said, I will always be Jewish, but I was first of all a Dane. And I think that has, uh, that has a, a lot to do with it. But it is, uh, and again, as I mentioned, there were some, I mean, there were some, um, my, my cousin was on a loft and there was an informer that helped the Germans get the people uh, uh, on the loft. Unfortunately, uh, it's a long story, but my, my my cousin managed to escape to Sweden. But uh, those are some of the reasons. Thank you. Hope, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, thank you so much for speaking. I just want to say that you and your mother are so, so brave. And um, I really admire both of you. Um, and I wanted to ask, because you mentioned that earlier in your story, um, when your mother was asked why it is that she didn't run, she said that it was because she wasn't sure it was as serious of a situation as it ended up being. And from the perspective of someone who also comes from a marginalized identity, I was wondering, what is some advice that you could give to people like us who are surrounded by people who have the tendency to normalize a lot of the experiences we have to normalize like any sort of attack or infliction that um, is put upon our communities. If you have any advice for that, especially given the current historic moment in our country. I think today's hate is terrible. It seems to be getting worse and worse. It doesn't mean that we all have to love each other but be kind to each other, be understanding, be tolerant. I mean, many, if you look back on some of the genocides that have happened and the Holocaust, most of them are, re are relig uh, religious based uh, uh, genocides. And I don't understand uh, how people cannot be tolerant and uh, be more understanding of other people with different background, with, with a different religion and so on. It kind of go back to, I think the classic example is in my home country in, in Denmark, where you're first of all uh, considered in Denmark and a Dane. I mean, if you look at Chicago, I mean, there are Italian quarters, there are Hungarian quarters, and there are areas where most of the Jewish people live, and I could go on and on like that. And that, in my mind, that's not healthy. You, you, need, to, you need to integrate. And then I think through integration, you, you will understand each other much better. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for, for your talk and for your work to uh, educate all of us. I really appreciate it. And I'm really touched by your story. So I was wondering, do you recognize anything in our current culture, in the current political situation that would lead you to believe something like that could happen again, given our current climate? And if so, you already touched on this with the earlier question, but are there other recommendations you can give us maybe how we can deal with things politically to motivate our politicians to be, um, to, to work against racism? So I guess the, the first question- I, I, think, uh, I think I would prefer 
to stick with the genocide and Holocaust and not get involved in, in politics because it's a very difficult situation. And you ask if it could happen again. It has happened on a much smaller scale. I mentioned in the old Yugoslavia and I mentioned of Uganda and so on. So it has happened again, but not to the extent that it happened during the Holocaust where six out of nine million people lost their lives. I'm often asked, do I think something similar can happen again? I'm not, I like to think I'm not naive, but I think the situation today is very different communications. Whatever happened in one country, the whole world knows literally a second later. Uh, as far as the Jewish people are concerned, we have Israel today, which we didn't have uh, at that time. So uh, it, it, is a, it is a different world. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my question was, Mr. Metz, was that when you came out of the camp that you were in, did you have a problem adjusting to like accepting people who were German because like of what they did to you? That's or a, did and how did you have you adjusted since then? That's a great uh, if, that's a great question, and I'm glad it came up. And uh, I, I need to go back a little bit to answer the question. In the beginning after the war, when we were liberated, we were not able to differentiate between the Nazis and the rest of German, Germany. As far as I was concerned and my mother, they were all bad. We have gone through some very difficult times. For many, many years, we didn't want to have anything to do with Germany. We didn't want to visit Germany and so on didn't like German uh, families. Then when I started writing my book, I started thinking about it. Now, 70, 80 years later, what would happen if I met, if, if one of the students here today had German parents? I should treat them just like anybody who were American because they had nothing to do with it. Maybe their grandfather or grandmother had something to do with it, but they had nothing to do with it. So would you believe in two or three of my talks, I actually met people that came up to me afterwards and told them, German people, I feel very, very bad because my grandfather fought as a Nazi, and, and I tried to comfort the girl because I, I told her you had nothing to do with it. So I think it's a, and there were others example. I think I'm really glad you brought it up because I think it's a healthy evolution that I've gone through. I know other people, other Jewish people, whether they've been in camp or not, don't want to have anything to do with the Germans. And I'm not saying that they're wrong or that I'm right. We 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 all we all we all different. Hopefully, this this was a long way of answering your question. Oh yeah, totally. It, I think you answered it perfectly. I just wanted to say, in terms of today too, that's why I wanted to ask of you, like how people can change it for the future. That's what I'm just thinking of how I can advocate to like change the current climate. Yeah. Today, which is a so different thank you. climate we live in. But hopefully I answered your question. No, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, so um, I, can, I can finish this up here. So I have two questions. Um, my, my first question is, and, I, and this kind of ties into Mateo's um, you know, qu question that he asked, but when, when you did you know, realize that, that it wasn't, or that it was, you know, not like the the grandchildren of the of the uh, German people. Were you able to forgive the people or, or the German people that did these things to you? Because you talked about how they were young and that they were able to be influenced. Um, so that's my first question. And then my my final question is that: What is the best way now to teach people 
about the Holocaust? What are the exact, you know, what are the right resources and when is the right age to start educating people in, in school? Okay, uh, let me take the first question. If I understood it right, have I forgiven the Nazis? I think that was your question, right? Yeah. I have not forgiven the Nazis and I can never forgive the Nazis. And I know it's a good thing to forgive other people, but there's no way I can forgive the Nazis for what they did to my father and six million other Jewish people, plus many non-Jewish people. And I'll never forget, I gave a talk in a church and I was an elderly lady who asked me the same question. And I, and I said, I know the environment I'm in and I know, as I mentioned, it's a good thing to forgive, but there's no way that, that I can forgive uh, the Nazis. And the lady said, I'm sure God will forgive you for not forgiving the Nazis. Uh, on the second question that related to, just remind me, related to- uh, To educating people about yeah. the Holocaust. Yeah. I think like in the real estate business, location, location, location are the key words. As far as Holocaust is concerned, it's education, education, education. And I think you ask what's a good time to start. It depends on the development of the individual. I generally say sixth grade, but I've talked to somebody in fourth and fifth grade and they were unbelievable. The questions they asked, and I gave a shorter uh, version and made it more interactive. And they had all, they had, those students had read a book called Number the Stars. And I don't know if any of, of the students at your school read Number the Stars when, when they were in sixth grade, but that took place in Denmark. And it's a fictional history, so to speak. And it's about uh, a Jewish family who hides with a Danish Christian family and eventually they go to Sweden. So I would say sixth grade would normally be uh, uh, when to start. Okay, thank you. Did that answer that. both of your questions? It did, thank you. Um, yeah, because I know, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you answering that. Um, I, yeah, I'm so I could just uh, make a promotion, so to speak, for the Holocaust Museum for anybody who's interested in learning more. I would strongly recommend that uh, you visit the Holocaust Museum in Skokie. It's just reopening on, uh, I think it's on February the 3rd. And this may not be the right time to go, but later on, I, I, I think uh, that would be uh, very, very helpful. Yeah, well, thank you for, uh, for saying that. Um, it looks like somebody put your website in the chat. So if anybody has any additional questions, um, I'm sure they can just go through there. Um, and then, you know, I know your resources for your book and, and other videos and stuff are on that website. Um, and we'll be sure to, to look at that. So um, on behalf of, of everybody here, I thank you for, for sharing your story and telling all of us this um, is humbling and uh, a privilege to be able to hear this. So thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.